Okay. This is such an exciting presentation. Whoa. You said. Oh, you did put. He made them look all different. I have all kinds of little characters I'm used to looking at. So what regulatory part do you fly under? How many people in here fly under 91? Show of hands. 135, show of hands. 121? 125? Okay. I wrote this paper originally in 2003. I updated and redid it in 2006. And um, with all the changes and updates in regulations and guidance, I've updated it again. So we talk about the regulations. We used to call them the FARs, but that's not politically correct anymore. So that's, we call them 14 CFR. Chapter 1, parts 1 through 198, not FARs. We look at the FARs, the layout of them. There, we have SFARs, subparts, and appendices. This is really exciting stuff. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, when I wrote this initially, I wanted to come up with something that I thought was interesting, and the regulations that impact the passengers seem to be a kind of a neat intersection. And um, all of these people touch the trip in some way. All of these folks, that airplane's kind of annoying, isn't it? Um, all of these folks have an impact on the outcome of the trip. What you're going to hear me say again and again is policies, procedures, and processes. How many of you ever ever heard that from the FAA? You have all these policy, but you don't have any procedures. You don't have any processes. So let's say we have a policy here at ABC Airlines, and we don't allow green dogs on our airplanes. No green dogs. That, my friends, is a policy. So what we're going to do is we're going to enforce the no green dogs policy and, as management, we're going to support the enforcers of the no green dogs. The procedure, we're going to then have a procedure of how to describe how dispatch attempts or scheduling or whatever, whoever that group is, to advise the passengers that green dogs aren't permitted on our aircraft. But now, lo and behold, a green dog shows up. How does the flight operation consistently enforce this no green dog policy? Nothing is worse uh, than the boss calling up and saying, just this once, please let my green dog on board. Examples of this are plentiful. Where do we find them? We find them in accident reports. A really good uh, example is the Pilatus crash, March 22nd, 2009, Butte, Montana. Just this once, allow 14 people on my aircraft that has 10 seatbelts. Just this once. When is the green dog not a green dog, and when does the green dog turn into hazmat? Right, do you carry hazmat as a, one, as a 91? You fly me, you do. I travel with a little can of hairspray. I like a spray deodorant, aerosol type. That's considered under 17510 to be hazmat. 70 ounces of each container, each container being less than 18 ounces. There's also some alcohol limits, and it's based on the uh, potency of the alcohol. Dry ice is um, five and a half pounds per person. That's per person, not per seat on your aircraft. Interesting rule, um, and it's 175.10. We do have some 91 carriers that have gotten approval by DOT to be carriers. We'll talk just momentarily about the role of advisory circulars. They're just a reminder. It seems like there's a lot of confusion about what an AC is. They be first uh, became effective in 1962. They're numbered to reflect the regulatory part to which they speak. And if you want to know more about them, 13.21.46c, uh, everything you ever wanted to know about ACs and we're afraid to ask. It's kind of interesting because we often see folks that are trying to uh, mandate uh, advisory circulars. It's one means of compliance and generally not the only one. 
So I know you're dying to know what these six exciting regs are, so I'll take all, this, all the, the um, suspense away, and we're going to talk about portable electronic devices, use of seatbelt shoulder harnesses, child restraint systems, supplemental oxygen, passenger briefing, carriage of cargo, stowage of food, beverage, and passenger service equipment during aircraft movement on the surface, takeoff and landing, and that's where we're going to start with portable electronic devices. As an interesting aside, in um, Part 91, PEDs only applies to IFR flight. In all the other regulatory parts, it applies at all flight. Um, the good news is that you will not be having to remove your pacemaker, and I think you'll find that comforting. Um, changes have been made, but they haven't been made to the regulation. We fly on XYZ Airlines, and they now let me use my iPad, my Kindle, or my phone at all times. Well, not really. Uh, not in the transmit no mode during takeoff and landing on the airlines. But this became pretty relevant because passengers said, pilots are using PEDs on the flight deck, and the guy in 2B uh, is not allowed to use a PED. So how, how did that happen? It's not raining airplanes. Regs 91, 21, and 135, 144. And then there's some FAA legal interpretations that I found interesting, that portable GPS units, which are attached via Velcro, tape, or hard yoke mount, that require an antenna even internal or externally mounted, are considered to be portable electronic devices and are subject to the provisions of 91, 21 or 135, 144. Interestingly, one th uh, the 135 rule does not address portable electronic, um, it specifically um, PEDs authorized for use as an EFB to replace required paper manuals or other applications. Um, kind of an interesting, if, if you kind of like that stuff, which I sort of do. Uh, Radio Technical Commission for Aeronautics, that's who makes all these decisions and they're uh, chartered through 2007. And they have some recommendations that uh, PED um, testing should continue, that there should be public awareness campaigns and government and industry should continue to research. The interesting AC on this is uh, 9121-1C, and um, it, we want to, came out on May 7, 2015, and we want to inform the passengers when it is permissible to use portable electronic devices. Prohibit their use during any phase of operation when their use could interfere with the communication and navigation equipment or the ability of the crew to give necessary instructions in the event of an emergency. So if somebody's listening to their PED with their headset on, and you'd have to beat them over the head to drag them out of the airplane, that would probably, um, that would probably uh, get, keep you from having the ability to give necessary instructions. Grace, even if it's something as, as minuscule as some sort of inner, um, irregular operation. Uh, formerly, it was recommended in the preceding material that you would prohibit their use during um, takeoff and landing. And part of that was probably for the stowage issue so that you didn't have the stuff out because that kind of had to um, be at the same time. So you're going to have to accept for some conditions. And what we see on the airlines um, is that they have a weight limit. And I guess the calibrated eyeballs of the flight attendants um, is, is part of how they do that. But we would recommend that you define this and readdress it at a certain interval. Uh, all of us are having to fly on the airlines at some times, and so I think we're kind of calibrated, and our passengers are also calibrated by the airlines. So it's good for us to keep track of that. What about headsets? I think you're going to see some interesting things with this because of the new iPhone that doesn't have a headset jack and is only using Bluetooth. I'm waiting to see something get published on that. Has anybody seen anything regulatorily? I haven't seen anything coming across the bow yet, but it will be pretty quickly before somebody will decide. Because the Bluetooth issue has kind of been, um, people, we're not sure what they're going to do with it. And then the other thing that they've said about headsets that I find interesting, how many of your uh, business aircraft, if I plug into your system with my headset, 
How many of them can you broadcast information across your PA and it comes through my headset? Do you all know? That would be a good thing for you to try to look into. Because one of the things that RTCA said is you can use it if it's plugged into the cabin entertainment because the broadcast works, but I don't believe that that's consistent across fleets and especially the aftermarket and how things are installed. MPEDs were also included, and MPEDs are medical portable electronic devices, ventilators, things to activate limbs, and um, part of the AC, it's now in there, and portable oxygen concentrators. Um, and they need to be secured. That's kind of the same theme and variation. Cellular phones are not, cons not included as the FAR because they're under the... Uh, Federal Communication Commission, this area continues to have additional research. The 1991 rule was imposed over concerns about potential interference with cellular ground networks and concerns with electromagnetic emissions might uh, unintentionally affect. But what it really was all about was billing because they weren't real good at capturing what tower you were pinging and all. So it kind of went under this. There was an advance notice of proposed rulemaking that published February of 2014, closing on March 2014, to allow passengers to use cellular phones. But out of 1,794 responses, there were only 11 that were really positive to allow. And technology isn't the issue. It's passenger behavior. You don't want to sit next to the guy who's in the seat next to you who's fighting with his girlfriend or his wife about his girlfriend or whatever. I don't want to sit there. So what we're going to want to do with our portable electronic devices in our flight operations, we want to develop a policy and a procedure. We want to make certain that it's written down, that it's trained to all crew members, that our passengers are aware of it, and that it's enforced uniformly, and that we as an organization support the enforcement enforcers and revise it as necessary. Uh, the other thing about this is because this uh, portable electronic devices in particular are probably one of the most um, moving targets right now. It's kind of interesting and um, there's, a, there's been some amount of publish uh, uh, publicity given for it. Use of safety, number two, use of safety belt, shoulder harnesses and child restraint systems. This is the only briefing that is required for all aircraft by regulation. A 172, a TBM, to a Boeing. You gotta brief. Fasten your seatbelts during movement on the surface, take off and landing. Over two, over 24 months they have to wear a seatbelt, use a shoulder harness if it's so equipped. If the aircraft was certified to be equipped with a shoulder harness, it's not optional that you utilize that shoulder harness. It's probably one of the more violated things that we see. If you're having problems with people utilizing it, I would suggest you do what we do. We clip it to the, the uh, seat belt, and it kind of takes a little bit of, I, I can break a nail trying to get it out of there. So we've had more luck keeping them on by doing that. Um, and then the, also, the other thing is um, it, um, they do recommend that you keep your seat belt fastened, um, what, even while seated. Um, Good luck with that one. Um, does anybody's airplane have a placard? Do you know if any of your airplanes have a placard that says seatbelt's supposed to be worn while you're seated? Like it does on the airplane, on the airlines? You see that on the... Might be an interesting one. I don't think anybody's airplanes placard that. But after, in 1995, some serious turbulence incidents happened and it was recommended, but I don't think it ever happened in corporate. My favorite one is secure the coffee pots. Stow the laptop cases, but hang on to your children. 32 pounds of projectile, not a problem. Questions about chat, uh, lap children that your flight department needs to address. Do you permit them? Or does your flight department or charter operation not permit lap children? Restraints would seem like the best place for that child. Most car seats meet the requirements. There are some old ones, and the the um, reg talks a lot about you know it has to be it has to have a sign that says that it's um, been certified for aircraft. So if your passengers picked one up at a yard sale and it's really old, it might not have that placard. 
Most of our passengers aren't coming on with the yard sale crowd, but you never know. Some vests and lap held restraints are floating around that have that say that they're FAA approved. They're not. There was one for a while. I think it was called Be Safe uh, with a baby. Um, that that was not. Um, ever certified. I believe they tried, uh, if I look back at the history, they tried, they applied, they kept going back and they couldn't get it approved. Um, always must be placed in a forward-facing aircraft seat. It goes against what you're thinking, that the child would be safer in an aft-facing seat, in that seat, in that child seat, but your logic and what's been tested just aren't quite the same. Company policy and procedure should be that only the parents, guardian or the person charged with the safety of the child, affixes the seat to the, the into the seat uh, restraint. When putting the car seat into the aircraft again, it has to go in a forward-facing aircraft seat, um, secured only with the lap belt. I have seen some pretty interesting gyrations where people have tried to use the shoulder harness. You know what I said about the shoulder harness? It doesn't apply for the child's seat. Um, remind, uh, not by the emergency exit of doors if it's possible and remind the parents to remove only the child leave the seat. We'll get another seat that looks just like it. Okay, So we want to leave the seat, get the kid out um, most of the time. I was on a Falcon 900. They had two side facing sofas and there were two car seats on the side facing sofa. It was a corporate department and they were afraid to go to Mr. Big and talk to him. He couldn't fire me, so I went and talked to him. And um, he said, but it's much more convenient because the nanny can sit there between the twins, you know, and, you know, they're kind of out of the way. They're in the, and I said, well, that's really nice, but, you know, even an aborted takeoff or something, you could snap off their little necks and you'd have to get two more that looked just like them. And he, when he kind of looked at me with that stunned look that only people of that caliber get, he said, I think I understand your point. I understand that the same day he called out to the flight department and said, you know, I've decided that we're going to change where the children sit on the, on the airplane, and I got a really good idea. Let's get rid of those two sofas. Let's go in for a new interior and, and fix that. So I didn't know that was going to happen, but you just never know. The FAA does recommend that infants under 20 pounds go in to the rear-facing restraint, so the restraint would face the back of the seat, just like in the car. 20 to 40 pounds, a forward-facing restraint. Children over 40 pounds, the seatbelt and shoulder harness always are on. Um, that's it. Have any of you seen the new CARES device? Has anybody seen this, the new CARES thing? It's really cool. It's... Um, it is an FAA-approved harness. Um, I've had the opportunity to see it a couple of times. Um, we do a lot of work with an air carrier that's based on um, um, out in the islands, and so they do a lot of long hauls, and they have these. Um, 22 to 44 pounds, up to 40 inches tall, sitting in their own seat. It weighs ounces, and it kind of goes around the seat. I don't know if any of you have a need, but it's CARES, and they're really kind of cool. Anybody seen them? They're, they're, if you fly infants or little kids, it's pretty cool. Clearly, this is a hot topic. I've written on this for a number of years. Um, but I do have something kind of interesting to bring up. Um, we want you to set the policy. We want you to enforce it. Have you heard that before? We want to document it so you know. And then I'm going to tell you that in 91, you don't have to have a seat for every person. Did you know that? You don't have to have a seat belt for everyone. Um, in 135, 128, it requires a separate seat belt. 91 does not. So it would be worth some conversation. Um, the real place you can find a lot out about this is that Pilatus, Butte, Montana. That's a really good accident for you to review anyway. Um, because in that accident, we see a lot of procedural noncompliance where he never put Prist in the airplane. Have, are you familiar with the crash? And then the 10 people and in the NTSB, they kind of refer to them as, as, as cargo because they weren't strapped down. They, 
There, and there's some argument about if they were under, they were not, there was one that was probably under two. Um, you can build more than one child, but there, we're, when we talk about that, we want to remember the next regulation that we're going to talk about. Um, the other thing that I've found rather disturbing is that um, an AC has come out and the FAA announces that it will not mandate the use of child safety seats on airplanes because of this increased safety risk to families. So what this is, is it's more dangerous to you to drive than to fly. Yay, aviation. See? Um, in 2004, nearly 43,000 people died on America's highways and 13 in commercial flights. And even when you factor in GA flights, it's minuscule. Statistics show that families are safer traveling in the sky than on the road. FAA Administrator Marion C. Blakely. We encourage the use of child safety seats on air. On airplanes, however, if requiring extra airline tickets forces some families to drive, then we're inadvertently putting too many families at risk. I haven't seen yet how you're going to drive to the Bahamas, but, you know, when that happens, you can come back and tell me you told me so. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration supported the FAA's decision based on current FAA and NHS, NHTSA uh, studies that show a mandate could result in another 13 to 42 fatalities on the highways. Crazy. You know, with the miracle in the Hudson, I was really kind of hoping that maybe we'd, we'd have a good case there, but I was wrong. If you're using restraints, be consistent. If you use child restraint systems, be consistent. Um, note, has anybody seen inflatable seat belts yet? Do, I, do any of you have them on your air? Is anybody seeing them? Any aftermarket guys seeing them? Um, we have them on a, the, an air carrier that we're working with. They're in test with them. That's kind of interesting. Um, we're starting to see them on some commercial operations. Um, you need to have develop a policy. We know the safest approach is no, no lap children. Um, if you fly in Europe, you know there's an interesting um, reg for that. But right now, you're okay under differences that you don't have to have one of those belly belts. Some carrier, some um, countries are requiring a belly belt. So I guess we're going to crush the kid. I, I'm not really sure. If lap children are permitted, what are your procedures? And where they should be, they, where do you put them? If we're going to allow lap kids, where are we going to put them? And the real reg is supplemental oxygen. Because the reg says that it has to be available for each occupant. Isn't that interesting? So I can hold a lap. So I, I worked for um, a, a fractional, and we had somebody who bought a beach jet, and they had two sets of twins in the family. And so they thought they were coming on board with seven adults and four children. And so I got the phone call, and they said, oh, my gosh, we have 11 people here. And I'm like, well, that's, that's really interesting. We didn't, they didn't manifest them. What do we got? And they told us. And so the problem is we didn't have any oxygen masks for them. So the overage of masks is covered in 21, one, uh, 1447. That's when the Part 25 where the aircraft is built and how it's certified. And um, there's generally, there is two masks in the lab. If you have one mask in the lab, you have two. Get your mind out of the gutter. It's so that if you're assisting somebody in the restroom, I, I saw you. It's 9.30 in the morning, and you weren't there. That's, that's what that reg is about, is if we're here to help somebody else, that there would be a mask. It's also pretty important that you know where those masks are. If you have a cabin safety person or a flight attendant on the airplane, that person needs to know where the mask is so that in the event of an emergency, she doesn't rip it out of Mr. Big's hands to grab it. And then the question becomes, how many lap children can you put on your aircraft? And it's totally based on where those masks are. I would encourage you, if you're going to do this, to do a physical audit of the aircraft oxygen masks. Because every company that we've dealt with, that we've dropped the masks, it's not in accordance with what the maintenance stuff had said. That's an, kind of an interesting one. What if it's a short flight and at low altitude? Yeah, you, you can do that. You could put them. So that was one of my things with the beach jet guys. Well, if you'd like us to, what we could do, I'm here to help. We can stop about every hour and 15 hour, 
to get some more fuel because we're going to burn fuel through fuel. And they decided that maybe they would do something else. And it was actually kind of a good eye-opener for our crew, too, and I was really proud of them for bringing it to our attention. I would encourage you to work with your maintenance team to determine where those extra masks are located because I don't think anybody that we have that has pulled these recently um, saw what they thought they would see. Then we have the most violated reg regulation going with pilots not using masks. And we know that that would be the procedural noncompliance. If you're choosing not to use your mask above 41,000 feet, I I'm sure you all do that because you would not want to not do the reg. But we know that this is a huge issue, and there is now a working group working on this. If you're not aware of it, I have the website. You can kind of keep track of what they're doing. The issue is that if we're not going to do what we're supposed to do, which we are supposed to wear our, our masks, and if we're not going to do that, um, we've got to figure out what else we're doing. Are, were all of you aware that that's been out there? And um, it's a working group. It, it's an interesting way how it came out. It was a stage three is bail audit. They wrote a white paper, and um, the client felt that it was a very violated uh, deal. And um, kind of interesting that that's how regs change. Things also change in, in the FAA when you take an interest and and you will be the one who will go to Washington, D.C. and sit down across the table with all the muckety-mucks and say, you know, this RVSM thing is really bogus. And, and they say, well, but we like it that way. And then they say, so what do you do? And I say, my company writes manuals. And they said, oh, so you make money off of RVSM? I said, oh, no, we've never made a penny off them. They're just a drain because they're just almost impossible. So I'd encourage you on these types of issues, if you care and want to show interest, um, NBAA is a really great resource, and that's why the three of us from Domestic Ops have had the opportunity to facilitate and watch some of this stuff changing. Um, this one is going to be interesting. I'd encourage you to keep track of it, especially if you have an aircraft and you fly over 41,000. Supplemental oxygen, the information needs to be known to that scheduler. Uh, we want to do that so that the more people are not scheduled and can be accommodated under the rule and how you're doing it, the actual location. Here's the deal. So if you know that you have an extra mask in your double club, that's where the infant on the lap has to sit, okay? Because that's where the mask is. Um, and again, you don't want to, you want to know where they actually are so that you can seat the person in the airlines. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but they have markings on the, on the mask, on the, um, on the PSU that shows which ones have extra masks in them. And on the crowd killers, the um, ERJ, there's a few rows that have extras. So you're going to want to know that, and you're going to want to make sure your scheduler knows that. And you might have to tell them, for this flight, we're going to see seat you in this section. Just a good FYI. And you look like you have a really good idea of what's going on. The fourth exciting reg we're going to talk about is passenger briefings. They're required on Part 91 and 135 flights. They differ somewhat. 91519 is for large aircraft. So if you are flying a TBM or something that doesn't meet that requirement, um, you just have to brief the seatbelt. Now, nobody in their right mind would not want to brief all this stuff because um, they might be hauling my dead carcass out of the aircraft, so I want them to know this stuff. Uh, we hear people in 135 that say we have to do exit briefings where you actually don't unless you have more than 19 seats. And remember, the applicability for the 500 series regs are large aircraft. So in 519, what are we going to brief? Smoking. If Mr. Big can smoke a stogie on the aircraft, when can he smoke? What's, what do you do? You can't, I mean, there's controls that have to be made. A briefing needs to include when the stogie can be smoked. Um, use of electronic cigarettes. Um, we're working with an air carrier. We have a couple of them right now that are really toying with the uh, use of electronic cigarettes. 
um, cards, under briefing cards, printed cards if used. The Reg 91 does not require briefing cards. But it says that if they're provided, they need to be specific for the aircraft. And I love this. And um, ICAO, on, this, on the other hand, does require the use of briefing cards with all of the um, um, location of all the emergency equipment available on the aircraft. That's an ICAO, Annex 6, uh, Part 1 and 2 both require. 135, we don't have an issue. 91, we have an issue. The other thing is if the printed cards are used, they have to be available, conveniently available for the passenger's use. And I don't think the galley drawer really qualifies, but it's your airplane. But I think you might want to look at that. Um, if the side-facing um, sofa has a shoulder harness, which it does because generally to be certified they do, that shoulder harness has to be used, and you have to brief that it has to be used. Um, who's going to brief? When are they going to brief? It says, but need not be given when the PIC determines that passengers are familiar with the contents of this briefing. What's your company policy? Do you brief every time? It's kind of annoying if I fly on it every day. You know, how, how do you, what is your criteria? Is it written down? Do you have it? Do you all know what you're doing? Or if I get one guy, is he going to do it? And the other guy isn't? Is it consistent? Is it documented? Do you permit smoking? Do you have the conditions? 135 is a little bit more clear, but the, the can of worms in here is a who. The oral briefing required by paragraph A of this section shall be given by the pilot and command or a crew member. So does your FISDO allow the cabin safety attendant or whoever that person is, if you have that person in the back, are they allowed to give it? What's your criteria? What did you use to get it? How are you making sure that it's given? Uh, you may use a recorded device, but the PIC is responsible. Um, this one is a little clearer. It says the printed cards are required, and they must be convenient for the use by the passenger. And that's why the galley door just doesn't really work. 135s, you're good at this. I don't see a lot of problem. Um, but, you know, we got to do it because it's the right thing to do. We need to make sure that in the event of an emergency, that we'll get this. We'll, we'll, people will be getting out. On 135, 117B also says, before each takeoff, the pilot and command shall ensure that each person who may need the assistance of another to move expeditiously to an exit, um, um, if an emergency occurs and the person's attendant has received a briefing. So you have to make a specific briefing for some of your passengers who might. Um, now, that briefing, incidentally, the... the, um, the Passenger briefing for the person who may need assistance of another. Does uh, This paragraph does not apply to a person who has been given a briefing before a previous leg of a flight in the same aircraft. Isn't that kind of interesting? I just keep shaking it up to see if you notice. The fourth one is carriage of cargo. Passengers would never dream of bringing their golf clubs into the cabin of the airline, would they? But on that CL-300... Scheduler may be able to circumvent by asking questions when the trip is booked. We have certain flights that we know bring a lot of bags. You know, I, I'm sure it's a business meeting at um, Augusta uh, National, but um, placing skis in the aisles of aircraft, golf clubs in the lab, and household furniture in the cabin of business jets, unless an improved cargo restraint system is used, probably violates 91.525. I worked for a company, and one day the big truck came out, and here was tables and chairs. She had bought a dining room table, and we were going to take it to Fernandina Beach. She said, well, I thought maybe you could just put one or two chairs on, you know, for the next couple trips. And I'm like, yeah, we're not doing that. Um, be consistent um, in compliance. Effectively communicate to the passengers and the crew. I don't even want to bring it up, but I'm going to go there. Do you all carry firearms? Do you take them shooting? All of that, carriage of cargo, what are you doing with the ammunition? 
Are you schooled on that? Is it accessible to the people? It'll be a good conversation. You guys can talk about this fun stuff. Carriage of cargo. You know, want to know your company policy on the role. What do you do? Are you the company that's going to allow them to bring the golf clubs in the cabin? Do you allow, do you make it be um, secured? Can it just sit there? What's your deal? Um, the regs are the same for 91.525 and 135.87. However, 135 requires it is stowed in compliance with the section for takeoff and landing. I love this part. 91 is silent on when you have to do it. How does that happen? Kind of interesting. I'm not going to be the one to rain on your parade, but pets, not assist animals, but pets, need really to be restrained. How are you going to restrain them? Perhaps to the AFMO seat. We used to put them on a leash and fasten it to the lab and the beach jets. Um, in a carrier, if you make them put it, the pet in a carrier, what are you doing with the carrier? Is it just sitting in the middle of the aisle? It's a really good conversation starter. I have news for you. I know it's, it's the apple of the owner's eye, but it's really, it's kind of cargo. I know it has a heartbeat. I get it, but it really needs to be restrained. Assist animals, on the other hand, do not. Assist animals are specially trained. But how many of you have flown on the airlines and you've all of a sudden seen a plethora of assist animals? I mean, holy crow. We were on a flight to Alaska in June, and I bet there was six assist animals. They were barking. That they had that was peeing. That's not an assist animal. On your operation, what are you doing if somebody, a charter, if they say, I have an assist animal? I can go online today and buy a vest and a certificate that says that my cat is an assist animal because I have an emotional distress if I'm not with my cat. It is a crazy world. I would encourage you as a company to discuss this and come up with some things so that you're more aware of what's going on. The same song and dance here, same verse, same uh, second verse, same as the first, a whole lot louder and a whole lot worse. Company policies, be consistent. Um, it needs to be communicated, and somebody needs to tell them that the stuff that's brought onto the aircraft, other than the one that sits in a seat, is considered cargo. Now, hasn't this been fun? We're already to the last one. See how time flies? Stowage of food, beverage, and passenger service equipment during aircraft movement on the surface, takeoff, and landing. Food and beverages at the seat. So if I am on United Airlines, God forbid, and I bring a, a Starbucks cup with me, I can keep that at my seat, right? But if I'm in first class and they give me a Dixie cup full of something, before we take off, they come back and get it. Have you noticed that? So why the difference? Well, the deal is if it was provided by the certificate holder. So if they bring their own, it's not provided by the certificate holder or the operator. I worked for, as some of you know, one of the fractionals, and this is really near and dear to my heart because I got to sing and dance to this one. Because we used to have cups that had our company name on them, and we landed and the inspector came on board to check our use of our EFBs because we were in that um, test period. And lo and behold, they dropped the door. Uh, the inspector came on board and there was cups in the window ledge thing, the, the cup holders that had our company name on them. So that is not permitted because that's clearly from the operator. From, and in that case, and a 135 would be the certificate holder. At that time, we were still 91, but it's still a violation. Um, written policies, uh, procedures. Another interesting thing about that is um, without a flight attendant, the, the reg is interesting. How are you going to make sure that the stuff was stowed um, during the... the uh, 
The interesting part here is that the flight attendants under 91 and 135 need to be seated um, for takeoff, for movement on the surface. In, in 121, they're allowed to be up to be performing safety functions, safety-related functions. There is no such permission under 135 and, and 91. Um, even to perform. Nothing provided by the certificate holder. So this might require some discussion. We go into companies a lot, and we see on their, um, on their, in their cup holders, they have the little bottles of water. Are you abiding by? What about plastic cups? I get people all the time to say, well, what if it's plastic cups? So we were somewhere fairly recently, and there were wine glasses in there because Mr. Big liked um, wine glasses. Now, I said I wasn't going to go here, but I, I'm going to go there. So how many of you berth seats before you take off? Please don't show me hands. Um, is that is that tweaking the regs? Can you really do that? What does the placard say? Most of your seat placards say that they have to be inboard, upright positions, etc. I think you ought to look at that if you're allowing that berthing of seats. And then I've seen the jet bed on top of everything. Is that in? Is that really in? in accordance with the regs. It'll be a fun discussion. You'll be the hit of the water cooler because you'll have some really interesting discussion points. In conclusion, existing written procedures should be reviewed to assure that they do not conflict with the Federal Aviation Regulations and the Federal Communications Commission. When I first started doing manuals, we used to see Fairly frequently, it would say, give the person a cup of coffee before you take off. It would say, after you, after you um, at the top of your, of your flight, you should get out of your seat and go prepare their meal for them. We don't see that anymore. And if we do, we nicely autocorrect people and, and direct them to why that's not a good idea. Because I'm pretty sure nuking Mr. Big's meal or getting it out of the oven that you put it in before you took off, I didn't hear that. But um, that's really, really not, in, and that's not a physiological reason for you to be up out of your seat. Regulatory issues must be handled in a professional man manner, manner. If you are putting the child restraint system in the wrong seat, if you have it in an aft-facing aircraft seat, and you need to change that, now's the time to do it. Who and what is affected? All the members of the flight department team. Don't forget about the scheduler because they're often, or the dispatcher, the person that's taking the trips or whatever, they're often pretty critical to the success. The management team may need to become involved in the cabin issues. What is, so what is your role when these, ro when these roles, <laughs> your role in the roles, are misinterpreted. Much discussion is probably going to happen. We haven't really spoken here about the risk of violation because it's not about avoiding violation. It's a good practice. You want to operate at the highest level of safety. Nobody comes to work and says, I want to be the worst charter operator in the world. I want to be the worst Part 91. I want to I just want to go out there and see how I can defy. You want to, everyone does want to be in industry leading. You're here because you care. You operate within guidelines. Are we encouraging you to change from customer service to customer disservice? No, no, and no. Your passengers want to know what to expect when they fly on your airplane. You can't ignore these safety concerns, nor are you going to want to. See, that wasn't that bad, was it? Did you learn anything? See, it wasn't that bad. And most of you stayed awake. 